Um, I'm going to tell you about elliptic curve cryptography, which has generally seemed to be at present to be kind of the best overall, in many ways, approach to public key cryptography. Here's uh, Neil Koblitz. He's the one on the left. And he's shaking hands with the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam, who's on the right. He's also a UW math professor, so you may have taken or will take a class from him at some point. Uh, but he does a lot of traveling around um, to places in the world. Very hard calculus midterm questions. <laughs> so I hear. Yes, and yeah, he's a t very tough calculus teacher. Um, he also wrote an autobiography, which is pretty interesting. For example, um, he talks about how he learned abstract algebra by reading Ling's algebra book while in prison. For <laughs> he, he joined the military during the Vietnam War in order to protest the Vietnam War from within the military. And then they threw him in military prison. So he's pretty serious about his convictions. Um, but in any case, he also introduced elliptic curve cryptography. He's a number theorist. And um, he and uh, this other guy, Victor Miller, I think independently introduced elliptic curves uh, as an alternative to working with numbers modulo p directly. So I'm just going to kind of give you a sense of how that works and show you a real example. OK, so remember Diffie-Hellman, the thing we talked about on Monday. It's something that you do in the group of numbers modulo p under multiplication. So I've, writ I've written that as z mod pz with an asterisk, meaning it's you just take the non-zero numbers modulo p, and they're a group under multiplication. If you multiply two numbers, you get another number in here by just reducing it modulo p. And there's inverses. Um, given any number, there's an inverse modulo p. That is some other number you can multiply it by so that you get 1. Um, that's the case, by the way, if and only if p is a prime number. Well, or 1. So if and only if either p is prime or 1, will z mod pz star be a group? Actually, no, z mod pz star is always a group, but the non, but I don't want to get into that. OK, so um, here's how it works. Very distinctly, you choose an element in the group z mod pz star. Two um, computers or people or whatever that want to share a secret, they want to publicly come up with a shared secret, they generate random numbers a and b. And they send each other g to the a and g to the b. And then they can both compute the shared secret g to the a, b. So this is a super powerful crypto system. It allows the public to agree on a shared secret. And it's really, really simple. I mean, it's just, just that's it. You, you kind of understand it, right? I hope at this point. Um, now here's the idea. You can change, you can replace h. It doesn't have to be the non-zero numbers modulo p under multiplication. You can also, here, look at that. It doesn't flicker here. You can also use, you can use any multiplicative group at all. Just take an element of a multiplicative group, your favorite group, like, I don't know, the symmetric group or something, and then choose an element and then generate two random numbers, raise them to powers, and you get a shared secret. Symmetric group would be really bad because, um, the shared secret would be enormous. But if you can find some group where it just makes sense, you can use it. And there are lots and lots of different possibilities. Here's an example of one that, um, well, actually, sorry. Let me abstract a little more first before showing you a bad example. Another thing you could do is instead of using a multiplicative group where you write things <coughs> as multiplication, you can use an additive group. The only difference is that instead of writing uh, g times h, you write g plus h. So. Uh, as foreshadowing, because I'm going to talk about a particular class of additive groups, suppose you have an additive group E. Um, an example might be the integers under addition modulo P. Okay? The only difference between an additive and multiplicative group is just notation. There's no actual fundamental difference. Except typically, additive groups are um, commutative in that you can add in either order. Uh, but here's how Diffie Hellman would work in an additive group you choose a, a specific choice of element P. You generate random numbers a and b and send each other a times p and b times p. By which I mean you add p to itself a times and you add b to itself p times. And then everybody sees a times p, everybody sees b times p. And a, capital A, capital B, they can compute the shared secret, which is a times b times p. But it's difficult for everybody else to compute that shared secret because all everybody else knows is p and b 
times b and a times b. And it's hard to find, hopefully, p, uh, b given b times b. It depends on the group you're working in, of course. So here's an example of Diffie-Hellman in an additive group. And this is a bad example because in this group, it turns out it's easy to solve the discrete log problem. So let's take our group to be z mod pz under addition. So the elements of the group are the numbers from 0 up to p, minus 1. And the operation of the group is you add together two numbers and then reduce modulo p. So uh, there we are. And now here's what happens when I use Diffie-Hellman in that group with um, a prime that has about 50 digits. So I let p be the next prime after 10 to the 50. Everybody sees that. I choose my base point, capital P, my generator to just be the number 1 modulo p. And then I choose two random numbers, a and b. So capital A would have chosen the first one. Capital B chooses the second one. These are the two numbers that they make public, a times b and b times b. And then the shared secret, which they can compute, is a times b times b. And you can compute it either as a times bp or b times ap. And there it is. So that's their shared secret. They might think, oh, this is really fast and nice and simple. Um, but they're in trouble because look. Well, look in a moment. <laughs> look, if you have, let me just evaluate this so I can actually show you. The numbers are going to change because it's a new random number. Given a, p, and p, these are two numbers modulo, <laughs> actually this is possibly shockingly easy. Um, so secretly, here's what a was. It's kind of easy to find a, isn't it, in this case. <laughs> um, so I could have chosen p to at least not be 1. That would make it a little more um, difficult. Yeah, it's really obvious here. Let me make it a different random number. Um, OK, so my capital P is at least some other random number. But still, look, given A, P, and P, it's easy to find A. Watch. Um, here's what A really is. And then you can do this divides. And look, it found it. See? The very first line, I just do A, P divided by P, and it can find it um, in 1.64 microseconds. So the discrete logarithm in the additive group of numbers modulo P turns out to be something you can trivially solve. And it just, um, the, the way you do that under the hood is using the Euclidean algorithm, which is, has complexity uh, polynomial in the number of bits of the input. So it's super fast. So the additive group is no good. But as soon as you know, Diffie-Hellman came out, certain people like Neil Koblitz and Victor Miller started thinking about, hey, what about my favorite abelian group? Maybe I could use it instead of the multiplicative group mod p. Um, and here is the favorite group of people that are number theorists, um, an elliptic curve group. So here's an example of an elliptic curve. Notice it's a cubic, it's defined by a cubic equation. So it, whoa, somebody just, why did you do that, Simon? Um, so it's defined by a cubic equation, y squared equals x cubed minus 3x plus b. So it's a curve in the sense that if you were to, say, plot the solutions to y squared equals x cubed minus 3x plus b, or some choice of b, in the plane, in the, like the real numbers, you'd see a curve. OK, that's why it's called a curve. Well, it's the reason it's called a curve. Um, we'll view it just as the set of solutions, x, y, where x and y are numbers modulo p, so they're between 0 and p minus 1, and they satisfy the congruence y squared equals x cubed minus 3x plus b. Here, b is this big number, and p is that big number. Everything's modulo p, and there's formally one extra uh, point thrown into e, which we'll call the point in infinity. The reason I chose these parameters is because this is what's called the NIST curve p192, NIST being the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And they have a list of recommended elliptic curves for use in cryptography. Um, and this is one of them. So here it is. This E is just a set of pairs, x comma y, of numbers modulo p. But it turns out, and it's really, really shockingly deep, that you can give E a structure of abelian group. There's a way of taking two solutions to that equation and adding them together 
to get a third solution to that equation. And it's by no means obvious how to do this. It's, um, or it's actually relatively obvious how to do it, but it's not obvious that it gives you an abelian group, which is really strange. And the thing that's, that's really hard to prove is that the binary operation has the associative property, believe it or not. It's usually when you are proving something's a group, that's not the hard thing to show. But it turns out the associative property is quite difficult to show. Um, the group operation geometrically, if you do everything kind of algebraically, interpret this algebraically because we're working on P, so you take two solutions and you draw the line that they determine. So you draw the line that goes through those two solutions. Because that's a cubic equation, there'll be exactly one other solution that lies on that line. So you take the other solution and then you reflect it about the x-axis. And that's the group operation. You take two solutions, draw a line through them, you get the third point of intersection reflected about the x-axis. It turns out that gives you an abelian group that has the associative property, it's commutative obviously, and so on. Um, it's not, it has nothing to do with just adding points coordinate-wise, because that wouldn't give you something on the curve again. Okay, so there it is, that's the NIST curve, and now we're going to um, use it with Diffie-Hellman. So I've just written the same thing as above. And I've constructed this curve in Sage. Sage has a command elliptic curve, which, by the way, was in Sage and very, very well developed before there was a command integrate or differentiate or anything like that. Because um, Sage started out as a piece of software for number theory. Elliptic curves are really central in number theory. And then calculus functionality only got added later when um, Bobby Moretti who is a UW undergrad, wanted to do a project with me in like 2007. And he's like, oh, I'll make Sage easy to use for calculus teachers. Here's another amazing thing. So this thing I just defined above, this set of points, you can compute the number of solutions to the equation y squared equals x cubed plus blah, 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 modulo p very, very quickly in just a matter of moments. The reason is because of uh, there's a really surprising and really, really deep algorithm involving modular forms and so on that was uh, invented by the guy in the middle here. He's actually normal height, maybe a little taller than me, um, named uh, Rene Scope. So he found an algorithm for computing the, card the number of solutions to an elliptic curve equation, which is extremely efficient and surprising. And um, I asked him once, like, how? You know, what, how did he come up with it? And he said that Hendrik Lenstra was uh, saying that there was no way to do this uh, to compute the number of points quickly. At least nobody knew how to do it. And so Rene was like, well, that's kind of weird. And he went home that night basically was like, that can't be. That's just ridiculous. He's Dutch. And, um, and so he just sat down. And apparently that very night, he came up with a polynomial time algorithm, which he could use to count the number of points on an elliptic curve. It took a lot of work by other people like um, Noam Elkies and Oliver Atkin to make that algorithm practical and efficient, but at least something that was polynomial time he came up with using some cool ideas. The basic idea is to count the number of solutions modulo a whole bunch of other primes and then use the Chinese remainder theorem. And to count the number of solutions mod other primes requires some like really surprising deep structure that um, you have on elliptic curves. Okay, so let's actually do it. Uh, Apparently, what? Kind of spoiled it. So let me do it again. Because it caches it, so. Hmm, that's weird. It should take longer. I think, maybe it is that fast. Okay, it seems really fast. Uh, okay, it's really, really fast. I think. Um, okay, so there's a point that we have to choose as well. And here it is. This is, again, prescribed by this NIST standard. Um, you can use any elliptic curve you want in any point you want, but it's dangerous. Some elliptic curves re um, result in very bad cryptosystems. Here's the order of that point. It's the same as the order of the group, so it's a generator. The group itself has prime order, so that's not surprising. Notice I wrote is prime of R, where R is the order of the group E. All right, finally, um, let's actually use Diffie-Hellman. It's this simple. So generate two random numbers, A and B. So each of us do that. Then we compute A times P and B times P and make those uh, available to each other publicly. 
And then the secret is a times b times p, or b times a times p. They're the same. And in order to figure out the secret, an adversary has to take p and b times p, and then somehow figure out what b is. And that's extremely hard to do as far as we know. In fact, there's lots of um, surprisingly efficient ways of attacking the Diffie-Hellman um, or discrete logarithm problem when you're working with um, Z mod PZ star, so the original scheme, um, using something called index calculus attacks. And, uh, I don't know. They're really, really surprising approaches that are much better than you might expect. But as far as we know, with elliptic curves, there aren't such approaches. So they seem to be really, really good. So that's it. That's what I wanted to tell you. And I did it in 20 minutes as claimed. Um, and I'll just kind of leave this up for a second and ask, are there any questions about public key crypto? Yes? Um, so it's like the value component of like elliptic curve cryptography, like that elliptic curves are so hard to understand and therefore it's hard to crack the code, like compared to yeah. And they might not be that they're just hard to understand. They might be hard to understand in the sense that they're just fundamentally more complicated and there are no faster algorithms. But it turns out if you take um, the fastest known approach to breaking Diffie-Hellman for modulo a prime number p, so say p has 1024 bits, and you say, what's the fastest approach to breaking Diffie-Hellman? Then you compare that to what's the fastest approach to breaking Diffie-Hellman on an elliptic curve with 1024 bits, um, for an elliptic curve is dramatically longer. So you can use exactly this, so like for a much smaller key size on an elliptic curve, you get the same amount of security in terms of the best known algorithms. And this is really important when you uh, want to make your code fast, you want like, you, you connect to a website and you want to be really fast. And um, it, like using elliptic curves over just working with the numbers modulo p can dramatically speed up the you know, efficiency of your website. So for example, if you're Google and you have you know, billions of people hitting your website every week, then you want, like it really makes a big difference, the amount of number crunching that has to go on to um, make each connection secure. And so it's worth billions of dollars using elliptic curves over just working in Z mod PZ star in practice. Like it really does make a big difference. And they are really significantly harder to understand than just integers modulo p, right? Don't they feel a little more complicated? I mean, it's just the fact you have a group at all is surprising. Um, and just a, a super quick story about elliptic curves. They're used in the digital rights management for Sony PlayStation. And the engineers at Sony messed up implementing something with elliptic curves, just because elliptic curves are more complicated. Um, they made a, 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 there was a protocol where you have to choose a random number and <laughs> Instead, you have to choose it every time you, you run the crypto system. They chose it once and for all. and just hard-coded that into their software. And then like, as soon as you ran it a few times, because you used the same random number every time, it would break it. And then everybody could sort of crack the crypto system. So that was a huge just mistake in reading how the protocols work. So things are more complicated uh, with elliptic curves. And you can also consider higher genus curves. So sorry, higher degree curves, I should say. So instead of a cubic curve, you can take like degree 10 or something like that and try to see if that's better, but it seems that that's actually not better. So elliptic curves are like this beautiful sweet spot for public key cryptography. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, I guess I should also say Microsoft Research has, they do a lot of work on public, or an elliptic curve crypto and also um, higher degree crypto something they care a lot about. Okay, so that's that, and now um, I'll stop with this, and then